joining us next is none other than architect Kamal Malik. It's wonderful being here. I see lots of young faces, hopefully a lot of students. Um, I was asked to, or I picked this subject about something happened which changed the course of my life. I don't speak about architecture too much these days. I've just become a storyteller. So, I was, we have turned the clock back a little bit. My <clears throat> childhood was in the Himalayas. I was born and brought up there. My cradle, so to speak. And I think somewhere there, a seed was sown, maybe unconsciously, subconsciously. And that seed began to germinate at a point, and this is where I come to the, the, juncture, uh, the juncture where I said, my life changed. So here I was, finished with my architecture, full of enthusiasm, confident that I knew everything that is possible to know in this world. But there was something, and then people talk about a journey, and we always talk about a journey that we undertake. I'm going to share a journey which came upon me. I didn't undertake it. So it happened. I take no credit for it. So I actually wound up at the doorstep of the sages. It's a completely different journey. And when I was asked, what do you do and so on? And I said, well, I'm an architect. Oh, creative person. Can you create one leaf? And that put me in my place for all of life. He had, he had settled the issue. The second point, it's very important, you know. I'm not saying that this has to be the course of your life, but I'm simply saying that we need to factor in things that we are sometimes just not aware of. The second point said, before you come into the portals here, leave behind all, sorry, leave behind all your baggage. So I looked around, there was a little bag there, he says, no, that's not what I mean. I mean this. All that is borrowed, please leave it behind. So if you're honest, and I was honest with myself, it is all borrowed, whatever I knew, and I said, okay, dropped. The third thing, do not believe anything until you experience it. Now, this is something very relevant to the East, to our subcontinent, to this country, that our ancestors, our sages, and all those learned and wise men always insisted that do not believe in anything you experience, that's it. So, I humbly submit that this has been my experience. So, it's not something which is of either theology, it's not esoteric. It happened. But what is the impact it has on you? Okay, how does it affect you? Importantly, how does it manifest in terms of what you do with your life. Okay, we are designers, we do make buildings, we design an environment and so on and so forth. But how does it affect you? How, how do you change in terms of approaching the very concept of designing? How do you draw the first line? So, these are very, these are very important questions, you know. I mean, for me, they were vital questions. So, for example, we say, let, the most difficult thing, you'll ask an author who writes a novel, you ask a painter, 
You ask an architect, and they will tell you the most difficult thing is the first line. So how do you begin and how do you end? Our ancestors had put paid to this concept of beginning and end. They said there is no beginning and no end. So you're always in the middle. That's it. This moment is all there is. So you're in the middle. This is where you begin. There is no beginning and no end because there is no concept of linear motion in the whole cosmos. It's completely cyclical. So how can there be a beginning and an end? So what finally happened as a result of all this is, and I will keep it short because we could go on for a couple of days and not come to anywhere near closure of this subject, that you slowly, slowly begin to move into a different kind of world which is more centripetal instead of centrifugal. So whilst you're operating on the outside, but there's also an awareness of the inside. And how does this manifest itself so we can move on and get to some brass tacks? I'm not saying the solutions or what has happened here is because of this, no. That is not the implication. I'm simply saying that over time, I have simply become a catalyst and not a doer. Right. Now, let's go through a little bit of ABC. To understand what I am talking about, we have to go through four fundamental parameters that I have labeled as the four eyes. The first one is intellect. This word deals with everything that you have collected from the time you were born from your parents, from your school teachers, from college, from bosses, from media, whatever, and every part of it borrowed. None of it is your own. So that's intellect. Let's move on. The next, instinct. Born with you. This comes as part of your DNA. And unfortunately, over centuries, people have misunderstood or failed to understand this word because they always add a prefix to it called animal. The moment you say instinct, it's animal. But it's a wonderful thing, this instinct, you know, to listen to it. Third, intelligence. Again, born with us. And it surfaces really in a way when you're quiet, when you're silent. The fourth, intuition. This is where something from the beyond begins to enter, where you have moved away and something begins to happen on its own. You become a witness. You're watching things happening, no longer the doer. And what happens as a result is this tremendous sense of freedom. It's like letting go of the string of the kite and let it be picked up by the wind. So it's a, it's, it's a feeling of exhilaration that I'm not responsible for this anymore. I'm watching. I will certainly do my work. I will do it conscientiously. I will do it with full concentration and focus. But I'm not concerned about the results. We move on. OK. Now let's get to maybe how does this really work? So this is our home in the hills of Lunavla not very far from Mumbai, two and a half hours. I spend half the time here, and we are in the process of doing our design studio also here, but a number of projects are going on in this area. Now, you go to a site, and before, because I can, I'll digress a little bit and say that when a client talks to you, the first question they're going to ask you, what is this house going to look like? And they're quite surprised when I say, I don't know. But you're the architect, and you don't know. I don't know. How do I know? Let's see what happens. So you start to get into, and I will slowly take you through, firstly, the environment, the memory of the place. What is the memory? Here, you can see Shivaji's Tungi Fort right there. And there are five such forts that surround us. So there is a heritage, 
and these were all built with a local Deccan trap black stone. You see the way they embrace the hills. So you have what I call the memory of the place first. So you listen to it. So when I said witnessing, it also means you become a great listener. You just listen. You're not saying that I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. You're watching and saying, let me see. Then, our site particularly had about 70 foot of a drop, which means seven floors in simple terms. And we had three major streams flowing through that site before I came on it. There were trees, there's a forest, and there were some streams. And there was no, no indication of, of a house and built up form. So, it's very clear with me that we do not disturb anything. We let the streams be. We looked at the contours. We looked at the fact that there was a kind of um, little hillock running through a spur running along the site, very much like the forts. And the water runs on either side of it. And now it's the monsoons. It's the most wonderful thing. Because these streams just flow, as they may have for a thousand years. And who, and who am I to fiddle around with this scheme of things? Because we talk of sustainability, we talk about leads rating, but what about good, sound, common sense? And respect for nature. So we, so we looked at that. We looked at the foliage, the flora and fauna there. We looked at the sun angles, the wind movements. You can see Shivaji's forts. Just look at the stunning architecture. It's sinuous. It's, of course, it was meant for security. It was meant for many things, right? It's a fortification. But look at the poetry of it. Now, that's our site. And you can see the slope now. So at first, we do a basic diagram of beginning to understand how we are going to work with this contour, right? without cutting and chopping the hill. The second part was that we have a, a balance between what we call gravitas, which is those materials which are heavy, like stone. And they sit on the ground very much like the forts or echo of forts of Shivaji. But if you go to a place like Lanavla, where you don't need air conditioning the whole year, and you have natural ventilation, air movement there, it's always pleasant. Then. You spend all of the day, except for sleeping, in the outdoors, in the verandas and the open spaces, which is actually far more important than the so-called closed spaces that we have of homes. And it is very difficult, I know, for some of the people who, one or two of my potential clients, because the lady of the house, I'm sorry, I have nothing against ladies, but uh, she said that you don't have a single door to this house. But how can you have a door? There's a forest there. You know? Let's move on. Right. So what was the thing here? One of the highest rainfalls in the country is here, like Mahabaleshwar. Strong winds, very strong winds. So the idea of being able to, even though you had multiple levels like this, but you don't want to have an umbrella to go from room to room. That's not a house also. So what happened was very clear. We had a slope. We had these water bodies going. And we had this problem of having a flowing roof that would connect and not drench us when we went to our respective rooms. So I think it's a very simple brief that worked out in our heads. And that's how you can see uh, the, the exonometrics respond to it. It's all a very logical, simple process you know, that we go through. And that's how the roof starts to work. We do physical models of everything, like people always used to do. You know, we used to do in college and everywhere. We've forgotten now. We start simulating on that computer. But it's not palpable. You can't touch it. Now, the tree became a symbol for how our structural system worked. You have the trunk and you have the branches. It's very simple. There's no rocket science here. And we actually used very good engineers to do a composite wood and metal 
system of supporting points of the roof pretty much inspired by the tree. And this is what I keep coming back to because at the end of this whole exercise, I'm sure you will say, okay, what did you do, Mr. Architect? You're inspired by the tree, you saw the water, you saw this, but what did you do? Not much. That's exactly where I'm coming from, that I'm watching and witnessing. Now, just run you by a few of the images, as I said, time is short. How we pay respect to the terrain, the topography, and the stone is coming from 500 meters away. It's completely sustainable. You can see how the language of the hill at the back, is, it's uninterrupted. I'll just run you by some images, right? So you can. You can see how the levels have been addressed seamlessly. The roof moves through because of a function. It's not an aesthetic thing that I wanted something to look like this. Because today we want things to be looking like this. But that's not the point. There's a function here. You know how the wind is coming, you know the rain, you know what kind of a, a support overhang that you need. So it's a very logical pursuance of thought. It's not that I like it this way. And that little cotton box is a powder room. So there's even some play in all this, you know. Uh, we don't have to be so serious about architecture. This is the area, you know, we are Sikhs, North Indians, food. Not for me so much, but the rest of the family. So this area is the wood-fired pizza oven, the tandoors, the outdoor eating and so on. But you can see how the forest is very much alive. If you swim in the place, you find again you're surrounded by jungle because the way it's been lifted up because there are things like snakes there. So from a practical function, we lifted the pool up, have the sleeping areas, two of them underneath it. And uh, well, Nature uninterrupted. And uh, these pictures were taken some time back, but over the last year, the forest has grown and the house is seen less and less, which makes me tremendously happy because I'm not interested in seeing the house. You can see how it connects with the lake visually. The texture, the fact that if you see the wood slats, they actually express a language of these wooden slats are two-sided with a mesh inside, so that you can actually keep all your glasses open perennially and be able to have the rooms breathe. And yet you can see the forest outside, you can hear the sound of the birds, so the senses are addressed. A simple thing of a cycle stand, you can see how that geometry has worked out. That's my, uh, my bathroom. And we had a huge debate with my wife when we first moved in here that you have to put some frosted glass here. I mean, some frosted film here. So I tried to explain, this is a forest. There are no monkeys here also. Who is going to come here? Yes. You can see there. There's no way in hell, you know. But after six months, the debate stopped. So it's been left this way. Yeah, you can see how the height and the scale has been tackled. And the imagery of the fort is alive, because where the tree was, we could do this buttress. There is nothing contrived. And that's how the water is flowing. The veranda spaces. You can see the roof now is zinc, pure zinc. But we had to use this because I normally use mango tile. But when you're doing these kind of shapes, you can't cut tiles. So functionally, we had to switch to a lightweight material and then work with this so that it.
Okay, let's quickly change gear. I'll just take a couple of minutes on this. Uh, a lot of people find a comfort zone and saying, I enjoy doing this and I can do this well. For me, it's all about challenges. I don't care what the problem is. I think you can, and also I'm, I'm often uh, accused of not having a style. They're saying, come on, yeah, you did that house, now you're doing this building, now you're doing that. I mean, where is the style there? What is this style? I'm not a garment designer, you know, that I'm designing for autumn and summer and fall, you know, clothes. What is style? So here, and for me, I'm, I must confess that I've been working only with low-rise structures. Where I was born, in the hills, everything was close to the ground, close to the tree. Here, the client comes to me and tells me, 28 55-story towers, 12 million square feet, and I had never worked with a developer in my life. Never, in 40 years. So, I sat down with my son, who is now the boss. Maybe some of you know Arjun Malik, but uh, he run, he's the boss now, so he tells me what to do. Yeah. So, we sat down and said, Let's do first sketches that if we can bring something innovative to the table, we will do it. Otherwise, it's effort of one and a half months gone, no problem. And that's how we actually went there. But let me tell you, to, to cut the story short here, what were the three things that were bothering me? And I think it bothers all of us when it comes to high rise. For me, first was that I'm disconnected from the ground. I'm sitting on floor 50, okay? I don't know where the tree is. I don't know where the ground is. I just lost all connect. That's number one. What can I do about this? That was point number one. Can I do anything? Tomorrow? Number two, that can I reduce the density of the number of vertical towers hitting the ground because those 28 towers were driving me nuts. I was not getting too much space on the ground in terms of green spaces that I wanted to see. Number three, in the 50 acres odd, I had always said to myself that if I provide, if only I can provide an environment where there are no motor cars and the kids can cycle up and down ramps or walk through the whole complex, not only that, there is a metro station coming a kilometer away. They can also bike to the metro station, leave the bikes there. The idea was to get rid of this over-reliance on the motor car. So these were the things that were driving me. Very fundamental issues. No great. So what we simply did is, and I will run you by this, that we developed a central core and then Every five floors, according to the codes, you have to have a refuge floor for fire. So imagine, and it's very easy, I think design is sitting here. You have a core, and on every five floors, the blocks are going this way, and on the other five floors, they're going that way. And then you create five-level spaces where every 10 apartments overlook a five-level space where you can have trees, where the children could be playing, and the mother can actually call out from the kitchen to the kid. You may be on the 50th floor, but technically there you're only five, no matter where. Maximum five. You could be one, two, three, four, maximum five. So really, we try to do something innovative. I know the rules and regulations are anti any kind of creative thinking in this country because people feel that they are going to abuse this. They are going to close these and enclose them and make more apartments and so on and so forth. You know, We work with a very... Uh, strange kind of, uh, of thinking in this country, you know, where everybody is deemed to be, um, you know, guilty until proven in, uh, innocent, the other way around. So, the second thing was, we reduce the number of towers and take a higher density on the last 10 to 12 floors. So, I could reduce the number of towers from 28 to 19 and build the sky blocks. So let's move on very quickly because they're going to chase me off this floor huh? unless you stop them, huh? right? If you don't stop them, they're going to chase me out there already. Yeah. Okay, let's go. 
Yeah, just a basic idea of how we work like you would typically work with nice courtyards and so on. The streets and, and the pattern, the axis that emerges. That's how the green spaces start to form. And that's how the whole site plan finally comes around. I know it will take hours to go through this scheme, but I'll just quickly rush through it. And along the axis, we have all the major areas like the club and so on, and the bazaar. I hate this word mall, bazaar. So people can go, the nice karana shops, people can sit around. And the levels are connected by steps which become nice amphitheaters and places where the kids could be, you could have a performance there. So, I mean, in a way, how old towns used to be, they were living organisms, you know, and not this contrived stuff that we see of Gurgaon. I'm sorry, I mean no respect to people who live in Gurgaon. Uh, disrespect, sorry. Okay, now you can see how the massing on the upper level starts to work. Yeah, and that's how it is. And you also start getting terraces and greens up on top. It's structurally fairly complex. And that's how the spaces start to happen on top. Now, we do sun, st sun studies from January through to December again, so we can understand the impact of the shadow on the ground and what kinds of trees would grow in a particular place. Right. Now, this is how the blocks actually work. Can you see it? The simple central core, the swivel, right? That's how it works. Okay? And no great uh, innovation here. And uh, these are the spaces that form the five storied spaces actually where. The ladies can get together, people can sit around, and the older part of the family can be there. The kids could be playing here. So it becomes a nice courtyard space happening for every apartment has an access to such a space. These are the actual views of three of the towers which are under construction. So they've gone to 50 now, 50 floors, another five more, but I think they are never going to give permission again for this kind of thing. I think we kind of pulled it off. So just to give you an idea that even though you go to a, to a point which is high density, high rise, how can we designers bring about a certain sensitivity and a certain affinity to nature? Let's move on. Now, this one is a project we are doing in Kerala. And it's for Matrubhumi. It's a well-known uh, newspaper publishing uh, television and so on, media group. And this is a plum site in the middle of Cochin. And we could get through to the client and explain to him that can we create a public space, a civic space for the people? Because every person makes his building, he puts gates and shuts everybody out. I said, you guys are reaching out to uh, the person. You're reaching out through television, music, uh, books, newspapers. And now, when you make your complex, you shut him out. And this is ridiculous. So anyway, so we convinced him. And therefore, the two levels of this place, are, as we enter, are completely given over to the civic functions, to, to public space. Now, this is Cochin, just some romantic images. And uh, in Trisur, very close, they have a lot of brick kilns. And we, you know, when I told you we study the place, we go around, I spent some couple of hours in these brick kilns, understanding what we could do with this stuff, and so on. This is the typical way people work in Kerala. Now, that's the site that we have. Now, you can see the entire lower space comprises of an auditorium, a bookshop, an art gallery, an incubation center, 
you know, all of these spaces are essentially opened up to the public realm. It becomes a civic plaza of two acres. And their headquarter building gets lifted up over the level of the trees. So within the trees is old Cochin, which is how all of Cochin used to be. It never went over the level of the trees. And on top of it are these two blocks that float on the sky. This is under construction now. We should finish it in about 15 months. So you can see how the two blocks work on top. These are the sketches of how these blocks get lifted up and how the you know, plaza starts to form. These are exonometrics, which is more your language, where you can see exactly how it works, the brick part, and how the various functions are really exposed. The section, we, it's like the, the, the old north lights, which were there in the industrial buildings and so on. So it's a, it, you know, it's a language which is of the history, and yet it's very contemporary, as you'll see. Yeah, that's how the images start to happen. You can see how the brick has been used, and yet there is a very contemporary syntax of the architecture, which is a steel structure floating on top where their offices are, uh, the exposed concrete of the auditorium, the kund on the northeast, nice steps where people can sit in the evenings. Oh, these are, all, these are all timeless things, so they've been meshed into the whole fabric. This one was, is the art gallery. So we actually made this huge cube and lifted it up and floated it in, into the place of the bookshop. So it's like a piece of sculpture floating there and juxtaposed with the cylinder of the, wood, uh, of the brick. Now you can start to see how we start to understand the construction methodology. You can see how the pots are used to construct uh, the underside there. And then we've used steel and we've used jack arches, which are structural, completely. So it's completely structural language, no cladding. Everything is honest, and everything that is essential only is there. No messing around. And this is how you start to understand the inside spaces and how natural light moves in. The girders, they're exactly the way they are. Okay, and the last two minutes, and then I'll just run you by a small clip. Yes, two minutes, and then the clip. She said yes, you're all witness. This one, we are doing a very small project now, which is about completing of a house in Jaipur. And when I told the architects in my office that there's no concrete in this project, only stone, it's finished. The thinking was over. So we actually went about, I, I work in Rajasthan, so I know the mysteries. They know much more than the engineers. I'm sorry, again, no, no, no disrespect to the engineers. But they understand. What is stone? How do you cut stone? How do you, how do you cut so you don't cut against the grain so that its strength is diminished? Oh, there are many things which we guys would never want to learn because we, we can't sit with that guy wearing a kurta pajama. So I could do that, so one learns. Images, let's go over it. Jaipur, okay. It's a very simple plan of the house. What we did is, we built cavity walls, six inches, cavity six inches, six inches. So 18 inches thick with an insulation cavity where all our services ran. Again, very simple, huh? all of this is quite elementary. Right. And then, we, I asked my structural engineer, what size of stone should I use? Now this is very important. Huh? He said, let me think. Then I asked the mystery, what size of stone? He says, four feet, one foot, and six inches. I said, why? He says, because two people can handle it. Stop. So it's native intelligence. Anyway, so we will, we will move on, and I'll quickly run you by it. Now, you can see our, the 17,000 stones are all labeled completely in size, including the corner pieces. 
We knew exactly the size of each stone. So that, and we know what is coming from the lower ground up, how many stones, how many trucks need to come so that you don't crowd the site. And then the next lot, when the lintels need to come so that the vaults will spring. So it's actually becoming a mystery for some time to understand how things are built. Because we keep looking at elevations and this will look nice, doesn't look. Who cares, you know, about the looks? Let's, let's get to fundamentals. So that's how the house will look. But I'll run you by some, some images. These are some of the sections, how it works. And these are some of the images. It's, it will finish in another month and a half. But I'll just run you by some images of how it works. You see, it's like a stone working site. That's how the walls are done. We do the scaffolding, the shuttering, and then you, and you see the lintel, how he's cutting. You know what these two notches are? One is for the glazing to go in, and the second is for the track of the blinds to go in. So it's all done, pre-designed interiors into the stone. We have no frames in wood, it's all done as part of the stonework, and we just put the shutters in at the end. That's how they used to do it, a thousand years back. Now that's how they're making the vault, you can see. Just some spaces. These are some shots, you know, I go to the site and you can see how, how these spaces start to be evocative, because why the circle? Because when you're working with stone, that's how you can work, or that's how you can work. You can't just say, okay, give me a span of this much. It doesn't work with stone. That's the bridge that connects the areas there where we got the screens. Okay, just a short clip. We talked about a journey. And there's a very short clip, if they can play it off. Yes, the two of them said yes in unison. Wow. So it's, this is the journey, and before they started, for me, uh, one youngster from my office put it together. And I looked at it. And frankly speaking, I've even forgotten this.
No, it's there. Two minutes. Let's finish it. Thank you.